Who is slipping Jimmy's next mark, and how much does that really matter to Ohio State and Ryan Day? Welcome to the podcast daily. It is Thursday. That is Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward, and yeah, that quizzical look on Berm's face, slipping Jimmy, is still Jim Harbaugh. And maybe by the time this episode uh, reaches your feed, he'll have already made up his mind between the Chargers, Atlanta, or apparently the richest contract in college football to stay at Michigan with a poison pill. Where should Jim Harbaugh go, and does that matter to Ohio State? Does Ohio State actually need Jim Harbaugh to stay at Michigan, Bill? I don't know why they would need Jim Harbaugh to stay at Michigan. Should they want it? Maybe it's two different questions. I mean, uh, I, I guess from the perspective of you would like to beat him again before he leaves the NFL. I know that Ohio State and Ohio State fans sure enjoyed beating him uh, in the first five years of his tenure. Um, and have been made miserable by him for the last three years. So exacting some revenge before he were to go off to the NFL or wherever he wants to go, um, I'm sure would be would be nice for Ohio State fans. Um, but mostly I don't think they care. Um, they just want to beat Michigan. I, I don't know that they care who is uh, wearing the, the block M hat on the sideline there. But, but it certainly would be sweeter if it, if it were Jim Harbaugh. I think people care. Um, but I think people care on on both sides of it. Number one, I think that there is a segment of the fan base, the Ohio State fan base, that wants Jim Harbaugh to leave because of the it, the inevitable feeling of like Schadenfreude that comes with it. Like, hey, screw you guys. Here's your coach. Yeah, you won a national championship, but everyone knows it was tainted, and now your coach left, and your program is going to suffer. Um, on the other side of that, there's the I think people want him to stay because, as Bill said, like you want that revenge factor. Um, but also I'm a realist and I think my, my, my personal preference, if I'm an Ohio state fan is what, what makes Michigan easier to beat. Uh, and so I would think that having one of the best coaches in Cal in football period, I mean, let's, despite his own five start to his, uh, rivalry record against Ohio state, Jim Harbaugh is widely recognized as one of the better coaches in the sport. And so if he's not at Michigan, I think that's better for Ohio state. So I would prefer he leave because. But then it does take away some of the fun of the Big Ten and the oddity that Jim Harbaugh provides, which I personally, in, as putting my my media hat back on, really enjoy. Well, <clears throat> to Bill's point, maybe I should separate the want and need and, and phrase that poorly. But I, I don't think that it's an easy question to answer for all of the reasons that you guys have already laid out. Like, and I think <clears throat> all of this offseason comes back to Ryan Day. And who would he want to beat? A depleted version of Michigan next year. Like uh, I think Ohio State fans would feel really good about that. And maybe there's also an element uh, at play here, what we've talked about in the changing playoff landscape, that only a national championship is truly going to matter. And that's going to be the bar that Ryan Day is evaluated by. And he can do that without necessarily beating Michigan. I think that would still, still feel pretty hollow for him. And he has beat Jim Harbaugh once. But I, I feel like, there's going to be part of that legacy that if he doesn't get to do it again after losing three straight or even have the opportunity, it, there'd be something that tugs at him. He'd, he'd feel some remorse uh, and regret that he never got to do it. Like I, So I, I think you have to maybe take it in segments the way I asked the question, like who would Ryan Day want to be the coach at Michigan next year? Because let's face it, this roster uh, on the other side of that rivalry for Ohio State is going to be pretty depleted compared to the one the Buckeyes have put together. Maybe that's why Jim Harbaugh is taking multiple interviews with both the Falcons and Chargers and, and clearly intent on leaving. And it's his right to do so after having won a national championship and won three straight games in the rivalry. But from, I don't know how much credit Ryan Day is going to get from everybody, and I don't know the answer to that. If he doesn't, gets the rivalry in the right direction, but he does it next year against Sharon Moore and not Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, that, that is a good point. I, I think, and I, well, what does Ryan Day want? I don't know. What does Ryan Day need for narrative purposes? Like, I think it would certainly help him if it were Jim Harbaugh there um, <clears throat> next year and, and Ohio State does win that game. Because um, I actually think Michigan still stands to be pretty good next year, especially if they promote Sharon Moore. I think that gives them a good chance of keeping the roster intact. Um, and I think that defense especially is going to be pretty good. There, there's some stuff they got to figure out on offense, what, even if Jim Harbaugh does come back. But I, but I think that defense, as long as they don't lose anybody else um, important, has a chance to be pretty good. And and I think, like, 
beating Michigan next year from a, like a roster standpoint would still be a, a, a certainly an impressive win for Ohio State. But to your point, Austin, like Ryan Day, like nationally, I think the the thought is like Ryan Day has a Jim Harbaugh problem. In Ryan Day's mind, I, I, he beat them the first time they played on what he probably considers more even a footing. The second two games, the lo- first two losses to Jim Harbaugh, there's at least that question of of how the sign stealing stuff impacted those results. Um, and then this last one, he didn't get the coach against Jim Harbaugh. He lost to an interim head coach in, in Sheryl Moore. So I, I think he would very much want to beat Jim Harbaugh one last time to prove to people that he, in fact, does not have a Jim Harbaugh problem um, before Jim Harbaugh were to, I don't know, go decide to be an astronaut or something. Yeah, but he's not. This is the the the, the chance to beat Jim Harbaugh one more time or having to face him 10 more times is what's at stake here, right? right. I mean, yeah, he, it's, yeah, yeah, this is the time when it, what he says is serious. Like, I'm seriously not going to look at other jobs again. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, which is what he said the last three years. But if Michigan, who's offered him a chance to be the highest paid coach in college football, like if they get him to sign a new contract, I would be damned if that doesn't include a lot of provisions about his uh, pursuits following this this latest um you know flirtation with the nfl uh that said nobody like looks back at the jim trestle era and discredits jim trestle for beating rich rod right i mean like it, it doesn't matter it's ohio state and michigan it, the the reality for ohio state is that if you beat michigan at the end of november next year based on what else happens in the big 10 you may have to play them a week later so uh, you, you, there's a lot of things at play here that are a little bit different i i think from what we all knew, the Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers thing was starting to percolate back in, what, October when we first started hearing about it? So uh, the winning the national championship and going out on top, this this seemed kind of like it was always Jim Harbaugh's plan. Then the cheating thing became a part of the story. Uh, and now, whether or not Michigan, <laughs> it's unbelievable. They're like an abused spouse. Like They, they honestly are like, like this dude just keeps beating the crap out of them and they just be like love us please just stay like what are you guys doing have a little bit of self-respect the guy clearly <laughs> well, doesn't want to be there they did uh, find some right burn like it, it seems like some elements of the people covering the car the contract saga if you want to call it that they finally just realized like in the last week that hey maybe michigan's putting some uh temporary restraining order protections in here to to save it from itself when the ncaa sanctions come down like how did people not understand? Like we also heard that yeah. miles away from Ann Arbor, that this was gonna be part of the contract negotiations for the good of itself. How is this just part of the conversation now? I don't understand. Sure, but Wednesday they still offered him more money than any coach in college football history, so, with a pretty big asterisk. Yeah, I, I guess. But I mean, once you commit to it like that, you basically are just like, hit me again. I can put some stank on it. You know, like. This is the way it's going. Like, this is what you've agreed to. Uh, but it seems and has seemed pretty clear that Jim Harbaugh has has been looking for an out for the last couple of years. No one in the NFL would hire him the last couple of years. I mean, remember, he he told the team in Ann Arbor he was leaving for the Vikings two years ago. And it's like, oh, crap, they didn't offer me the job. Like, that became a problem. So now with the national championship under his belt, the reclamation project is sort of done. Uh, it seems like money is going to be one part of this component, but the other one in the NFL is how much uh, authority he gets, what type of uh, team control he has, how much control he has to hire his own general manager, et cetera, which it seems like the Chargers are willing to let that happen. So uh, I think all of this is kind of a moot point because it seems clear to me he's going to be going to the NFL, but uh, that's a lot of money that Michigan's offering, so maybe that's enough to change his mind. Can yeah, I ask I mean, you guys a question? Sorry, I have to kind of also make your point. Yeah, you can. yeah. no, I, I I do think like this hypothetical, is it better if he, for Ohio State, for Ryan Day, if he stays at Michigan, is purely hypothetical. I think he's leaving. I think he will get an offer from one of those two places, probably the Chargers more than the other. I, I, I just brought it up for the sake of, of argument and conversation in January because I think that's an interesting subplot for the overall Ryan Day conversation that we're having about this offseason and also how it contrasts to the one that Michigan is going through, which is that they're almost like they just won a title two weeks ago, but their ro- their future is in, I don't know, jeopardy and purgatory. Their roster management is unclear. Their, Harbaugh's been on this tour to take these interviews and during a period where 
coaching staffs are on the road for recruiting and you're handling the transfer portal and the NFL draft and all these other things. Like, y- yes, that's the reward when you win a national championship. Some of that stuff becomes less urgent and, and less imp- imperative for the future. But at that same time, Ohio State is like having the dream offseason and getting all of the headlines for managing all those things to really peak capacity. Uh, it seems uh, will, it will, the results will have to come down the road, but like they're doing two different things and going two different directions right now. And I think that that part is pretty fascinating. Um, Doug and I had a really long conversation about all this on Kings of the North. That'll be every out. conversation you and Doug have is yeah, it's really long. And by, by that, by conversation, I mean, Doug talked a lot and I nodded my head. Um, <laughs> but one of the questions, one of the questions that we uh, did talk about was how, how much we believe that Jim Harbaugh, assuming he is leaving, um, has built Michigan for sustainability now, like without him, like is Michigan going to continue to be this version of Michigan without Jim Harbaugh there? And I'm curious what you guys think of it. Do you think that Sharon Moore has the cachet to keep Jesse Minter from following Jim Harbaugh? Do you think that Sharon Moore has the cachet to keep Ben Herbert and the strength and conditioning program there when Alabama may be looking for someone new or, you know, I I think, or LSU or, or Georgia or Texas, I don't think he does, uh, and I think that even though I, Michigan will retain the majority of its roster because it, that would be the decision they make with Sharon Moore, uh, I, I do think that the other parts of it, and, and is Sharon Moore, one of the biggest challenges we've seen that Ryan Day's had in his time as a first-time head coach is going out and hiring a coaching staff, figuring out what the right moves to make were. And Sharon Moore, three years ago, was coaching at Central Michigan uh, and was the tight ends coach at Central Michigan. I, I don't know that you're ready to make that leap. Um, and it's not like 2019 when Ryan Day took over at Ohio State when he was getting a pretty complete roster from Urban Meyer. This is a guy who's heading into 2024 with a lot of changes to the roster. A, a qu- quarterback in Alex Orgy that you have no idea uh, if he is able to throw the ball, really. He's throwing one pass. He's th- in two years, he's throwing one right. pass. So yeah. you've got... a. a Maybe a Jalen Milrow type situation there. The offense, yeah, I mean the 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 run game, the power run game, what they do will stay there, I'd imagine. But uh, I don't. Uh, that's a tough ask and and a tough sell for me to believe because again, w- the reports we've all seen are Minter to the NFL with Harbaugh, Jay Harbaugh to the NFL. That's the longest tenured assistant there. So like, uh, coincidentally, I think guys that are closely linked to show cause penalties probably if, when the NCAA comes down the road with stuff. Well, so, Sharon yeah. Moore is going to be one of those people. Yeah, I mean, he's already on a show call, so I think, th- you know, he's been on one this year. So that that's the interesting part of that. But I, I don't know. I I personally don't think so, Bill. To to, to long story short, uh, my answer to your question. I'd have to give Sharon Moore more credit after what happened in November and in the absence of Jim Harbaugh than I did going into the season. I was was pretty skeptical of that when he was tied with the Northwestern job. I was like, why? I don't really understand the appeal, what he had accomplished that made him a fit or an appealing head coaching candidate anywhere other than Michigan, which would be more uh, intimately familiar with what he does well and doesn't do well. And if that would translate to being a head coach, having, you know, watched Ryan Day go through some of the on the job training and the difference between being an offensive coordinator and a head coach and, you know, immediate success, but then not, you know, some of the, hiring, staff management, roster management, things that we've all talked about. Like I, I think that this offseason has shown the most growth there, but I don't – Ohio State and Michigan are just really difficult jobs, and I would – I don't think Ohio State would want to do it the same way. They're happy with Ryan Day. They're thrilled with the person he is, the, the spot that the program is at with a really high floor, the opportunity to reach a higher ceiling next year, but – I think if you gave them an opportunity and say, you have to do this again right now, would you promote an offensive coordinator to be a head coach at one of those two places? I think Ohio State and Gene Smith would probably say no. And I don't mean that as a, as I said, an indictment against Moore or Ryan Day. I just think it's so difficult to do that the question would be, is did Jim Harbaugh build something that Brian Kelly could sustain and elevate? Yeah, probably. Is it going to be the same if you hand it off to a coordinator? I would say probably not. I think it, I think it would be dangerous to assume so. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, with the right hire, like someone with a lot of cachet, like a Brian Kelly, then then I think I think you're. I, I do think 
<clears throat> so the way we, we could approach that question was like, and, and and we kind of like looked at it through the Alabama lens of like what has happened at Alabama over the last 10 or so years. If 80% of that was because of Nick Saban and 20% of it was, was because of whatever is inherent in Alabama, I don't think it's quite that drastic for Michigan. I think it's my view on it was it was like 55 45 in favor of Harbaugh. Maybe it's 60 40 in favor of Harbaugh, but there is something about Michigan that I that I think gives it a high floor. Most of the time, you can make bad hires like Rich Rod and Brady Hoke, and then you'll find out what the floor is. But um, I, I think that as long as you make the right hire, the floor there is pretty high. And I do think Jim Harbaugh has like given them the blueprint for what success can look like at, at Michigan. Um, but it is it is a fair question in my mind, and I don't I don't I guess the fact that I don't have a strong lean either way suggests that that it is a little bit in doubt of whether or not anyone other than Jim Harbaugh can carry out that blueprint to or as effectively as it was just carried out over the last three years. Right. I mean, he carried out that blueprint effectively at Stanford. He carried out that blueprint in the NFL with the Niners and went to the Super Bowl. He's carried out that blueprint now at Michigan after, you know, taking five years to get it, six years to get it started. I don't know that you have that type of runway if you're Sharon Moore, because you're heading into a season where at Michigan, I think is like the number 18 recruiting class in the country. They lose a, a butt ton of guys to the NFL. I mean, they had 44 seniors. You are you get back some talented players, especially at defensive tackle and, and in the secondary. Um, but you're also entering into a season where you play one of the toughest schedules in the country after three years of basically having uh, your first 11 games handed to you. So uh, I think there's a major, major wake up call coming. Uh, and that's not even to consider the fact that the NCAA may levy a punishment as far as uh, scholarships go or bowl bans. Like there's a lot of other stuff that's still in play that I don't think. In some ways, maybe you make Sharon Moore the sacrificial lamb and hope that he can ride it out uh, and then come out of it on the other side in three years because he's already been there and won the national championship. Uh, I, I think that the bigger problem is that you don't really have the chance with a guy like Brian Kelly, knowing what potentially is coming, that he'd be saying yes to that What considering what he's already built at LSU. I know that there's been conversations about him, but now the SEC calculus has completely changed because Alabama and Nick Saban are, are different. So like that conversation about Brian Kelly three weeks ago, which is, oh, Brian Kelly wants the Michigan job. Maybe that's not the same anymore because now the SEC is a bit more wide open. I, I think that feeds into what I'm like, what I'm thinking about this offseason so far. Like, what does the future even look like for Michigan? Like, let's just assume that it's a post Harbaugh one. And we don't know when the sanctions could come down, when, or I, I guess you'd have to say if they will, despite the volume of evidence that took required some action from the Big Ten already in the middle of last season. You have that huge amount of turnover on the roster. You haven't been able to be all that active uh, in terms of the transfer portal. As you mentioned, Byrne, the number 18 class in the country, it, it's it's good. Like I don't know. It's not good. I, I know that. I, I'm, I, I'm just speculating. Yeah, I mean, and that's... Look it up. Tell me what it is. It's not, necess it, it's not necessarily the way that Michigan's rise was fueled by having top five recruiting classes stacked on top of the other. Oh, it has you been. think you'd be capitalizing on just the last three-year run. 100%. 100%. And so that's... Uh, what do you got, Bill? They're 19th um, in the country uh, with 27 high school commits, too. So, But I think the bigger thing is they've only taken two transfers. Yeah. And so... That's sort of what they built the program on the last two years. You know, yeah. Given or the way... Supplementing the program with, with those plug-and-play guys they needed. Yeah. Get... Given the way that they have built that program and supplemented it through the transfer portal, you just look at the roster and I just, Bill, you seem like a little more confident that if, if they were staying put, that like, they're still going to be a very good team. I just see a ton of question marks and I don't, yeah. I, I don't know what the answer will be, but they've also, I, you spend these last couple of weeks, if you start shifting out of championship glow and who cares if they take it away? They already got the parade. None of that. If you're just enjoying the celebration. Well, you are going to have to play more seasons. Like they're not going to stop college football because Michigan finally won another national championship. And I think they've given up a ton of ground here, even if they had Jim Harbaugh. I just I don't I don't know what their identity is once they lose him, which I think is inevitable. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I'm definitely. I, I would. 
sell the idea of Michigan taking any kind of significant step back. I, uh, clearly, they'll take some step back. I don't think they're going to go undefeated and win the national championship again. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think they're going to disappear from the conversation. Like I, I, I still think they're a playoff team next year. If they're going to figure out quarterback. If they can't, then, then maybe they're not. But um, I still think there's enough talent there for them to be relevant this year. And then, yeah, there's fair questions about what it looks like beyond that because they'll lose some guys. They're, they're not a recruiting powerhouse they recruit fine but not not in a way i think that makes you like a top five team year in in, in year out um there was something like i don't know kind of special and unique i think about jim harbaugh's ability to get a team that does recruit that way to be top five the last three years i don't, I don't know that just anybody um can do that so if but i also think there's there's value in like continuity with the Shiro more and like Burr made a good point. Like if if all the infrastructure leaves, like if they lose their strength and conditioning coach and the staff gets blown up and Sharon Moore really has to kind of like rebuild it from the ground up in terms of his staff, then maybe I'll feel differently about that um if if that comes to pass. But assuming I guess right now that it doesn't, um, I still think that Michigan will be Michigan, even if it's like a slightly lesser form than what it's been the last three years. Yeah, I, I think a slightly lesser form with all of the other things, like I said, the the schedule, the potential for NCAA penalties with scholarships and well, that's the big yeah, that's the big thing. Like if that if that shoe drops in a significant way, then then yeah, so, I mean you can look at it and see. Yeah, the, the, they still should be a top 10, 15 team, and you can put them in the conversation for the playoff. But if you look at the schedule, you look at Oregon coming into the Big Ten. I just have a tougher time buying them as a playoff team next year. Because they really, yeah, they're returning some key players, especially the younger guys on defense that that couldn't leave the Will Johnsons, the Kenneth Grants, the Mason Grahams, et cetera. But like they don't have, you know, Donovan Edwards is coming back, and that's that's good. I and mean, he had one good half of football in the 2023 season, and it happened to be in the national championship game. And but he's going to be the bell cow, and he's going to have to be because again, you don't know what their quarterback situation is and the transfer portal, which is where they've done a nice job in the last few years of supplementing, you know, the the guys that are coming up, the JJs and 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 Corum and, and those guys. Like they're just not there. And again, to me, that goes back to the point I made earlier. Like if you're the Michigan administration, you see all this happening. How do you let Jim Harbaugh just stay out in LA for a week? He's still under contract with Michigan. He's still employed by you. Like that that blows my mind, but neither here nor there. Also, another thing you know is really grinding my gears. What's that, Burn? This this whole uh, uh, this whole week, all I've been seeing is national folks saying Ohio State went all in on the transfer portal, and it's really kind of pissing me off. Speak on it. Ohio State had four transfers before Nick Saban decided to retire. Okay, four, and then they added Caleb Downs and Julian Sain, who you have no choice but to go after if they're available. It's not like Ohio State was pursuing them they just happened to fall into their lap and then it was like oh we will absolutely not say no to these players they went after four guys in the portal this idea that they were like trying to wholesale change their roster in the transfer portal is bunk and i don't like it are you suggesting that your boy lane kiffin might have influenced a national narrative somewhere else about a different program problem (laughs) don't don't you do this don't you bring up lane kiffin had nothing to do with lane kiffin it had a lot to. They didn't start calling it that national narrative until Lane Kiffin was like, "Hey, I'm going to tweet something that's erroneous from two years ago." The article he retweeted was not about the transfer portal money. It was NIL total, and that includes the players that Ohio State needed to retain on their roster. This idea that I've seen from multiple national media folks in the last 48 hours that Ohio State decided to go all in on the transfer portal is stupid. They've they've brought in six transfers, and two of them were because they were like, "How can you say no to these guys?" Like. They were not making an attempt to resh- reshape their entire roster in the portal. Like, that's just not true. The Everything they did from December to January was to make sure those eight or nine guys came back to school. It had nothing to, like, the portal was for just fitting a piece here or two. It wasn't for this wholesale change, bunch of dummies. Your hero <laughs> provided the implication that $13 million was spent in the portal. That's your boy. Look, I can't he help did it. people are dumb enough not to read a story. Okay. We're just looking at the list of transfers. Like, <laughs> they have six. Louisville has 26. Texas A&M no, has 23. Like, Colorado so has 23. Indiana. Indiana has 22. What are we doing? It's a idiotic uh, assertion that people are making. <laughs> and I, I just, it's pissing me off. I'm with well, you. I, 
I want to tie that into the last point that I was going to make after what you were talking about with Michigan before that, Berm, is like their offseason, if Jim Harbaugh does take a job elsewhere, becomes a lot more complicated as well be because suddenly there's a 30-day portal window for guys on the Michigan roster. So again, like that's a more immediate pressing concern that could also change things that's not just the NCAA or the Big Ten or anything else. I mean, these guys would have their choice whether they we could find out that all of them want to cast their lot with Sharon Moore, but I kind of doubt that that would be the case. So like m maybe some of this conversation we're having is premature, but the point is the same with Jim Harbaugh is just already checked out for a week or two weeks or whatever to go hang out in LA and try and get the chargers job or flirt with the Falcons. The The repercussions could still come and they could still come pretty quickly with the same thing that happened when Nick Saban retired with Caleb Downs and Julian Sayan being available along with Caden Proctor going to Iowa. Like that the Michigan roster is suddenly wide open for business. Yeah. And again, if you lose Jesse Minter, your defensive coordinator, and Jay Harbaugh, maybe Steve Sklinkscale, maybe Harbaugh takes Ben Herbert to the NFL as a strength coach. Maybe he loves him that much. Like there's a lot of ifs and, and buts that come with that. So um, it, it, it it's not something where I think you can look at the Michigan setup and be like, well, don't worry. All these guys are going to stay with Sharon Moore. The defensive players don't give a crap about Sharon Moore saying, like, that's not the way it's going to work. And if, if, if Jesse Minter is going to the NFL, that's that changes the calculus again. But don't they just have like a factory in Baltimore where they spit out Jesse Minters and <laughs> that guy, yeah, that guy Mike, Mike McDonald's? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that uh, John Harbaugh, if his brother is then in the NFL, is going to be so willing to just send stuff to Michigan for. Well, he seems incredibly loyal. He was allowed to just come over and hang out with his brother during the middle of the national championship game. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Michigan be very, very uh, important in helping get guys on sidelines they don't belong on this year. <laughs> there it is. We made it almost 27 minutes without saying Connor Stallions or making a Connor Stallions reference, but that feels like a good place to bring it home on the podcast daily for Thursday. It's never too early to talk about the game, right? It, it goes on all year. Let's do it. Let's dive into uh, the rivalry. I hope you enjoyed that. And if not, uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We're going to have Zach Boren in for a Freaky Friday Boren Blitz, and we'll talk a lot more about Ohio State specifically and not as much about Michigan, which we don't do at all. Uh, Spoiler alert. That's Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. Appreciate you hanging out with us. We'll talk to you later.